On behalf of the entire leadership of the ATA, I want to thank you and, and wish you all a happy new year and welcome you to the series that we have for 2016. These are topics that our viewers that will inform you on how to manage your tinnitus today. I want to be clear up front that ATA does not endorse or recommend any particular treatment or product. The reason I say this is because tonight you're going to hear about several different devices and forms of sound therapy. This program is for informational purposes only and to provide you with an overview of what's currently available. So please do not mistake the presentation for an endorsement of any kind, not for any particular device or any particular treatment. ATA remains committed to curing tinnitus by funding research. It is so important that people can find some relief now and a way to restore quality of life. Whether you've tried this treatment or not, I think what you will learn tonight about sound therapy may enlighten you and make you look at sound therapy in a brand new light. And what better way to learn about this than from the experts themselves? We're fortunate this evening to have Dr. Norma Mraz, an audiologist from Alpharetta, Georgia, who is also an ATA board member, and Dr. Grant Searchfield, who is a member of ATA's Scientific Advisory Committee, speaking to you all the way from Auckland, New Zealand. We also have Connie Decker, who also is in Georgia, an ATA member who will share her journey with tinnitus. You're definitely going to want to hear her story. And Jody Asmus and Jennifer Bourne from the ATA staff, they'll be talking with us a little bit about ATA and helping to facilitate the webinar tonight. So before we begin, I'll just go over a few housekeeping items as well to help direct you to some of the functions you may be asked to do during the course of the webinar on your control panel. During the webinar, you will be asked to answer a poll. To answer the question, just click your answer with your mouse and by using your touch screen. If you are on the telephone, you will not be able to answer these questions, of course. If at any time you lose the audio connection through your speakers, please use the dial-in information provided in the email you received. If you lose both audio and video connection, just click the link you use to join the webinar to rejoin at any time. If you experience any other technical difficulties related to joining the webinar, please contact Citrix Customer Support at 1-888-646-0014. You may want to write it down, 1-888-646-0014. At the end of the formal program, there will be an opportunity for a question and answer period. This is a popular period of the, of the presentation. If you would like to submit a question, please use the question feature on your control panel. Due to limited time, we will not have an opportunity to have everyone's questions answered, but please do submit them. We will be able to use them in future webinars or in the Q&A column in our magazine, Tinnitus Today. I would also like to address some other features in your control panel. You are, in fact, in control of how you'll view the webinar. You have the ability to make the presentation full screen or not and control where you view the webcams on your screen. You may enlarge the screen by pulling down on the notched area of your screen and view. Or you can pull on the corners of the video and enlarge the screen. When slides are being shown, the video view will become smaller, but you will see the presenter at the top. Please take a moment to familiarize yourself Jackie, with these features. Jackie, I have features. to be gone they for will an hour. Come in, they will come in. Hey, I think we have someone who is not muted. Um, Dr. Mraz, possibly. OK, all right. Then before we get to Dr. Mraz's presentation, we're going to introduce you to Jennifer Bourne, ATA's program director. 
Jennifer has been with ATA since 2006 and has worked with the organization for various capacities. I'd like to have her tell you a little bit more about why tonight's topic is particularly relevant to ATA and ATA's history. Jennifer? Thank you, Melanie, and thank you all for joining us here this evening. As Melanie mentioned, tonight's topic is particularly relevant to ATA's history. If you are a longtime ATA member, you probably recognize the name Jack Brunner. Jack is one of our co-founders, and he is also credited with developing the first clinically accepted therapy for tinnitus, a sound therapy called masking. Dr. Searchfield will tell us a little bit more about masking and its evolution a little bit later in our program. But masking had a unique and unexpected start. In the early 1970s, Jack had just begun his research on tinnitus in Portland, Oregon. He received a call one day from a physician, Charles Eunice, who was from California, who was suffering from terrible tinnitus. Charles had learned of Jack's research and thought that maybe he could help him. Jack was just at the beginning stages of his research at this time and told him that he did not have anything tangible to help him at that time, but that he would keep him informed of any progress or treatments that may come out of it. Well, to make a very long story a little bit shorter, Charles ended up going to Portland anyway. And although at that moment Jack couldn't help him, Charles ended up helping Jack. During Charles' visit to Portland, Jack took him out to eat. Now, if any of you have ever been to the downtown Portland area, you know that there are many decorative fountains with running water throughout it. One fountain in particular, the Lovejoy Fountain, happened to be right outside the restaurant that Jack and Charles went to. As they walked up to the restaurant, Charles stopped. Jack looked at him, and Charles stood there with a look of shock and awe on his face. He turned to Jack and he said, standing here, Next to this running water, it's the first time that I have not heard my tinnitus since it began. With a little know-how on Jack's part and some patient feedback from Charles, Jack was able to take that information and create the basis for the first widely accepted tinnitus treatment, masking. After that, Jack and Charles also established the American Tinnitus Association. They knew that there was a great need for all people with tinnitus to get help and treatment and to continue to fund research on the condition. Sound therapy has come a long way since the early 1970s when Jack began his research. Tonight we're going to learn from two experts more about this important way to manage tinnitus. But quickly, before we get to that, I'd like to poll our audience and find out how many of you here tonight have actually tried a sound therapy in the past. And so you'll see the poll right there. Uh, the answers are yes, a desktop sound generator or desktop fountain. Yes, a wearable device prescribed to me by a health professional. Yes, combination devices, that is hearing aid and sound generators. Yes, some other form. Or no, I have not tried a sound therapy. And we'll just give a few seconds to let everybody in attendance lock in their vote. And then we'll get to see the answers to see how many of us here in attendance tonight have tried it. While we're waiting, I'll tell you, you'll hear both tinnitus and tinnitus tonight, uh, and both are correct. OK, so there, there you go. It looks like a large majority, um, about two-thirds of the, the folks in attendance tonight have tried sound therapy, and, a, and about 30% have not. So whatever your experience has been, I hope that you will learn things tonight from Dr. Mraz and Dr. Searchfield that you didn't know before. Melanie, I turn the program back over to you to introduce our experts. Thank you, Jennifer, for that brief history of ATA and our co-founders with ATA. I mean, it gives us an idea of how we came to know sound therapy and why it was a potential help and assistance for those that have tinnitus. Now I'd like to turn your attention to the main event. Our first speaker is Dr. Norma Mraz. Dr. Mraz is a practicing audiologist in Alpharetta, Georgia. <coughs> With her own practice, she earned both her Bachelor of Arts and Master of Arts degrees from the University of Florida. She earned her Doctor of Audi Audiology degree in 2004 from the Arizona School of Health Sciences.
After 10 years practicing audiology in Florida, she moved to Georgia, where she specializes her efforts in the treatment of individuals who are afflicted with tinnitus and hyperacusis. After studying the Tinnitus Retraining Therapy, TRT Treatment Program, with its creators, Dr. Pavel Yastrovov and Dr. Jonathan Hazel, she studied other tinnitus programs, such as masking and neuromonics. She has published articles on tinnitus in Tinnitus Today and the Hearing Journal, and has lectured on tinnitus and hearing loss at national and international conferences. I've had the privilege of working directly with Norma for the past four years on the HEA Board of Directors, and I can tell you that she is a pleasure to work with in addition to being extremely knowledgeable about current clinical best practices for tinnitus and hyperacusis patients. Now, please, let me introduce you to Dr. Mraz. Dr. Mraz, she's setting up her slides here a little bit, so we're going to kind of get it going. There we go. We want you to be able to see um, the presentation as well as be able to hear it. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Mel Melanie, for that kind introduction. For all of you new members or viewers, welcome. And to all of you established supporters of ATA, thank you for your unwavering commitment and support to this dedicated organization. To begin my talk, I'd like to walk you through what a tinnitus and or hyperacusis patient should experience during their first office visit to a qualified tinnitus health specialist. But first, I want to clarify a simple yet important fact. There is only one common denominator with tinnitus patients, and that is simply the word tinnitus. After that, each one of you are unique individuals. That is why a lot of what's being discussed this evening covers a broad spectrum of material. Each patient has their own set of circumstances that demands the attention from their medical professional because one tinnitus approach does not fit all. Also, understand that many ear and hearing medical professionals do see tinnitus patients, but very few actually work with tinnitus patients. That's important to understand because anyone can sell a device or a product for tinnitus, but there is usually no follow-up, follow-through, or proper guidelines or guidance that is designed to meet your individual tinnitus needs. Sadly, the message of hopelessness is still being said in 2015 and starting in 2016 um, by many, whether it's said with poor medical bedside manner that you'll just have to learn to live with it, or even with good intentions from a family member or a friend um, that tells you just try to not think about it. As a tinnitus provider for 20 years, yes, I dated myself just now, I have worked with many tinnitus and hyperacusis patients, and not one person's story is exactly the same as the next. You may begin your quest by searching out tinnitus information on the internet and find yourself reading other people's stories and experiences and for some reason begin to internalize it as if it were your own. And then you'll hear things like to avoid caffeine or salt and you'll avoid a whole host of other things. But in reality, many of it never really applies to you. Unfortunately, things are taken to such an extreme that the tentative patient finds themselves pinned in a corner and absolutely scared. One of our guest speakers tonight is a patient of mine and will share her story in just a bit. But allow me to say, at that time, I met a lovely woman who walked into my office clutching a large handbag, carrying every kind of tinnitus pill, vitamin, or herbal remedy you can imagine. She was frightened that food would make her tinnitus worse, frail from not eating with the look of desperation. She could barely stay focused on our meeting, but fortunately, she was accompanied by her sister. So stay tuned as you, she will finish telling you her story. So let's get back to how a, a patient, what they should experience when they come into my office. My first step is to understand 
their individual uh, tinnitus on SEDGE. So what will happen is you will have information to, to fill out in a questionnaire, like the tinnitus handicap inventory, the tinnitus reaction questionnaire, or the tinnitus functional index. These questionnaires are designed to understand how tinnitus is impacting a patient's life, the severity of the condition on their everyday living, and how they react to the perceived sound. In addition to the questionnaire, a comprehensive audiological and tinnitus evaluation is performed. The audiological evaluation is basically a hearing test which is done to measure if the patient has any hearing loss. Afterwards, a loudness test is done to assess sound sensitivity. An otoacoustic emission test is a test that's also done to measure the, the function of the outer hair cells within the cochlea in the inner ear. And if you look at the, um, as you see the slide that's showing now, the cochlea is the nice, the part uh, highlighted in yellow for you. Lastly, but certainly not least, a tinnitus assessment is completed. The tinnitus assessment helps quantify the perceived pitch and loudness of the tinnitus sound. These test results are discussed in detail with the patient and helps me determine what treatment options are best suited to address the tinnitus. For example, a high score may show um, on the tinnitus reaction questionnaire, which helps medical professionals understand how a person is reacting to their tinnitus. This also helps in determining if they would immediately be a candidate for sound therapy, or if a behavioral specialist should provide counseling first or in tandem with a sound enrichment program. In other cases, a patient's test results may show that they have a medical condition such as otosclerosis, which is a hardening of the tiny little bones in the middle ear, or those tinnitus onset is caused by an acoustic neuroma, a tiny tumor on the inner ear. This is usually the cause of their tinnitus and their hearing loss, and this patient may be a candidate for surgery. If successful, the surgery will resolve and the hearing loss and will resolve the hearing loss and in many cases resolve the tinnitus, which is interesting because that would be considered a cure. And yes, albeit not common, there are some tinnitus patients that can be and are cured with this kind of intervention. But let's focus on the majority of the tinnitus patients who are not surgical candidates. If no measurable hearing loss is present, then a sound device such as an MP3 player or ear level devices will be suggested. Products like Neuromonics, Serenade, or Tinnitus Relief app are other examples that may be appropriate. These type of devices have sound programs, pre-programmed, and patients wear the devices for a certain number of hours per day. The therapy is designed to help a patient habituate, and you'll learn much more about this later as Dr. Grant Searchfield is going to be giving this in greater detail. If tinnitus is accompanied with hearing loss as well, then hearing instruments, specifically combination units, it's a hearing aid and a sound generator combined into one. It, that would probably more than likely be recommended. I'd like to point out that hearing loss does not cause tinnitus, and tinnitus does not cause hearing loss, often said. But chances are great that whatever insult or injury that has caused the hearing loss is probably the same insult or injury that has caused the tinnitus. The group of tinnitus patients with hearing loss may have part of their tinnitus treatment addressing both the hearing loss but with the emphasis on the tinnitus because that is their primary concern. 
a tinnitus patient may not initially be aware nor care that they have hearing loss, but it is important to address because in many cases, when an individual begins to hear the frequencies where they have hearing loss, they tend to not perceive their tinnitus, which is usually a very comforting and welcoming experience for them, let alone being able to hear and understand others with greater ease. Hearing aids, sound generators, and combination units have historically been expensive and are generally not covered by insurance. However, many hearing aid manufacturers have begun to make these special devices more affordable so that help is avail available for everyone. New advances in hearing aid technology now allows a patient to stream nature sounds and music directly from their smartphone to their ear devices, which is extremely convenient for tinnitus patients since the majority of them use a smartphone on a daily basis. I want to quickly highlight a couple of points on habituation. Again, it's, it's basically how the brain can functionally change how it perceives stimuli, and in this case, tinnitus. But as I mentioned a moment ago, you're in for a treat as Dr. Searchfield will be giving a brilliant discussion on how the brain processes information. And in this case, we're particularly talking about sound. The purpose of sound therapy is only one part of a tinnitus program like tinnitus retraining therapy, or TRT. The other part, the most important part, is directive counseling. These counseling sessions are educational and are designed to help demystify tinnitus by explaining what tinnitus is and is not, and to adjust your tinnitus program accordingly. Habituation can occur in two phases. Habituation to response, meaning you hear the tinnitus, but it no longer bothers you. And that alone is a surprise for so many patients. The other one is habituation to perception, meaning there are periods of time that you become unaware of your tinnitus. And so, again, a very welcoming experience. By putting the necessary tools in place, like counseling, sound therapy, medical professional, it helps promote habituation. It is really important to mention that habituation cannot be forced to happen no matter how hard you try. And the simple reason is because this is taking place on a subconscious level. But there are things you will do on a conscious level to help this all fall into place. What does help is being consistent in using a variety of soft, soothing, and pleasing sounds repeatedly over the course of time to help promote habituation. And to reiterate, this experience occurs naturally, passively, and effortlessly in our subconscious brain, filtering the tinnitus away from consciousness awareness. You may ask, how much time does habituation take to occur? Well, that would be a fantastic question. It varies for each individual. Allow me to explain. We all started learning how to ride, or most of us did, on a tricycle. And what's exciting about that is you get on it, you start riding, and you, you're ready to be like the big kids, and you want to be on the two wheels. So now you go, and you're ready to promote yourself from three wheels to two. But interestingly, you end up on four wheels. The, four, the reason for that is because the brain, again, is trying to learn on a subconscious level how this is going to work because we went from three wheels and two is just too much for, the, for us to just jump on and start doing. So the, wheel, the extra wheels helps us do a higher level skill by putting extra tools in place. What's interesting is that when we take the wheels off, well, that's pretty exciting but we're still with assistance, and we have somebody holding on to the back of that bike, running with us down the street, and they're doing this all because they don't want this to happen, where we get more scraped elbows and knees that we really care to. 
But amazingly, we still get back on that bike, and we will do it over and over until we can master riding the bike. And when we do, well, that's just a feeling that not only the person who's been running behind you with it is excited about, but it is also exciting for all of those kids that learn how to ride their bike all by themselves. But all of this happens because that repetition over and over is what makes the brain go from, I want to do something. I understand it intellectually, but now I want it to fall into place subconsciously. And that's why you can't force it. All you can do is keep following the protocol so that the, what you're doing on a conscious level works on a subconscious level. One of the beautiful wonders of our brain is that the that um, the brain can process information for us all day without our conscious effort. We simply do not see, feel, hear, taste, or smell everything in our environment all day long. If we did, we would fail to function effectively as our brain is only capable of doing one important task at a time. So when incessant tinnitus is around, it is that one important thing that distracts us from other tasks we easily accomplished before tinnitus. Neuroscientists have recently discovered the part of the brain responsible for the continuous sensation of tinnitus and chronic pain, even long after the injury has occurred and healed. The technical term for that is called the nucleus accumbens a.k.a. the pleasure center. It is responsible for motivation, pleasure, and addiction. The nucleus accumbens facilitates learning new behaviors by pleasurable reinforcement. Research outcomes like this one has taught us that although sound can be positively impactful in reducing the annoyance and awareness of tinnitus, it is the sound that you find comforting and soothing that tends to render the best results. Because of the positive associations you have with those sounds, otherwise it would be a nuisance to you and it can quickly make tinnitus more problematic. So for some people, they enjoy nature sounds like running water or the sound of the wind blowing through the leaves. Others prefer soft music like classical or ambient genres and still others prefer and respond to traditional white noise, which is a broadband sound like the shower. To summarize, ATA, uh, to summarize, there is an array of sound generators on the market today. And these devices offer many conveniences, but these dynamic features and ever-changing technology is only as effective as the medical professional who is counseling you and guiding you through a tinnitus management program and of, a, and of course, your active participation. This affords all parties involved in your tinnitus and hearing care to understand the protocol to follow and to maintain realistic expectations so that everyone's efforts promotes the most effective outcome. We may not be able to cure everyone's tinnitus today, but we have resources available to help us that can certainly minimize the negative impact tinnitus has on a person's life. So please continue to support the American Tinnitus Association. We hear you and we are here for you. Well, Dr. Mraz, thank you so much for that informative presentation. I know that many of our audience members have not had the opportunity to go to a doctor who knows as much about tinnitus as you do. And I know your talk has given hope to many of the attendees tonight. That's our desire. It is good to know that there are doctors out there who do know how to help them. In fact, ATA maintains a health professional listing on our website of doctors, just like Dr. Mraz, who do know how to help people learn to manage their tinnitus. So if you are one of those people who has been told to go home and learn to live with it by a doctor or anyone else, please go to ata.org and click on Find a Provider. While there are other therapies for tinnitus, 
Currently, sound therapy is one of the most effective forms of treatment for tinnitus. Sound therapies do not work for every single tinnitus patient. This is why ATA remains dedicated to funding research to find new tinnitus management strategies and to further optimize existing therapies, as Dr. Searchfield will tell us about just shortly. But before we get to that, I'd like to bring back Jennifer Bourne to tell us about ATA's rich history of funding research and why it is so important that we continue to fund research in our search for a cure. Jennifer? Thank you again, Melanie. Since 1980, when we awarded our very first research grant, ATA has contributed over $6 million in what we refer to as seed grants to tinnitus investigators around the world. Our research grant program consists of funding awarded to both established professional researchers as well as to student researchers. Once the grants are received, a rigorous peer review process takes place by our esteemed scientific advisory committee, which, as evidence tonight, is comprised of some of the most talented researchers worldwide who are working on understanding and developing treatments for tinnitus. Each grant is evaluated through a set of criteria to determine its merit and its ability to push science forward. The proposal must also fall into one or more paths on ATA's Roadmap to a Cure, a document created by SAC that outlines four paths of research, two basic and two clinical. These will ultimately help us lead new treatments and cures for tinnitus. Once the grants are reviewed and scored, the highest scoring proposals are then forwarded to the ATA Board of Directors for funding consideration. As Melanie mentioned earlier, all of ATA's ability to fund research comes from the generosity of our members and donors, which consists almost entirely of individuals. That is something that every ATA member can and should be proud of. So for all of you who are in attendance tonight who are ATA members, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for your support of the research we fund, and thank you for helping to support our programs like these webinars. For those of you who are not members, we invite you to join us. By becoming an ATA member, you are directly supporting research that is leading to new treatments and cures for tinnitus. You will also get the added benefit of being able to see all six ATA webinars in 2016 included in the price of your membership. You will also receive our magazine, Tinnitus Today, which we have actually loaded for you as, as a take home. So if, you, if you're not familiar with Tinnitus Today or you haven't downloaded the most recent issue, if you look at your control panel uh, in the handout section, you'll see there is a, a PDF link that says Winter 2015 PT. Just click on that link and download the magazine for free. This way you can see if it's something you might want to receive on a regular basis. You'd also receive access to the member section at ata.org, which has a host of other member benefits, including all of the webinars that we will put on archive. So if you can't make a live broadcast, you can view it at your leisure. I want to just say that membership is just $40 annually, $55 for those of you who are international, and it can be done online easily at ata.org. We look forward to working with all of you toward a future without tinnitus. Melanie, I turn the program back over to you. Well, thank you, Jennifer, for all that great information about ATA's programs. It is true that our members are and have always been the backbone of this organization. So I would also like to extend my thanks to each and every one of you. Now we turn our attention back to sound therapy. But this presentation will be focused a little bit more on why sound therapy works and the auditory neuroscience behind it. I would like to introduce you to Dr. Grant Searchfield, who is a new member of the ATA's Scientific Advisory Committee. Dr. Searchfield completed his doctorate in audiology at the University of Auckland in New Zealand, and he is currently an associate professor there in oral rehabilitation. He is director of the university's hearing and tinnitus clinic. 
Dr. Re Dr. Searchfield is also a member of the scientific committee of the Tinnitus Research Initiative and leads a working group focused on the use of perceptual training as a tinnitus treatment. Dr. Searchfield is also editor-at-large for the International Journal of Audiology and an international editorial associate for the Journal of the American Academy of Audiology. His research focus is on cognitive processes involved in tinnitus perception and the development of innovative technology for tinnitus treatment. Dr. Searchfield, I gladly turn the program over to you. And again, we want to make sure we've got those uh, slides working properly, so let's kind of get those up and running. All right, we should be there and, and working. Um, I think so. I hopefully you can all see that, and thank you very much to Melanie and the ATA team for inviting me uh, to give this presentation. Uh, thank you to Dr. Mraz for a wonderful presentation before. That really sets the foundation for what I'm going to be talking about uh, today. Thank you also to everybody out there for joining this broadcast. Now I want to talk a little bit about some of the puzzles behind sound therapy and how they may work. Now it's important to understand that the auditory system is very complex and it would take me many days to sit down with you all and talk with you how it works in detail and indeed how tinnitus occurs. But what I want to do is to give you a rough snapshot of how uh, it occurs and to give you some ideas on how sound therapy can interact with the hearing system to help. So we've got a picture of the brain and the auditory brain is a, a link wiring between the ear which occurs in this area here and is connected to the hearing nerve which sends information via various neurons to what we call uh, cochlear uh, nucleus here and various other processing stations within the brain and these junction boxes in the wiring of the brain play a role in processing the sound as it enters up into the auditory cortex which is the main center of the brain in which the sound is actually processed. So it's a process by which activity starts at the auditory periphery and travels up very quickly to the auditory cortex, but at various stations here, this information is processed. At the auditory periphery, the information being processed is relatively basic. Is the sound there and what might it be? As we travel up through the auditory system, the processing becomes more and more complex and becomes involved with things such as our personality, memories, thoughts and emotions. Now, with tinnitus, we have a set of situations where, as mentioned, we can be associated with a change at the inner ear or the auditory system causing a slight hearing loss. Now, one of the consequences of the injury that's associated with that is there's a change in activity within the auditory pathways. Now, this is an image of activity recorded from an animal in a normal hearing situation and each of these little spikes here represents spontaneous activity within the auditory system. Now this is activity that's not caused by sound but naturally occurs within the auditory system. This lower picture is from an animal that has had a noise induced hearing loss and what we see is an increase in this spiking activity. Now this is one indication of a change within the auditory system that may be a trigger for tinnitus that occurs. We also know that the auditory cortex, the main place in the brain that actually analyzes sound, is involved in tinnitus perception. Now these are some recordings from individuals with tinnitus and these areas here in this picture that are shown in bright colors show a response or change for the presence of tinnitus in the human brain. So we know that the auditory cortex, which is involved in processing sound, is also involved in processing tinnitus. But this is where perhaps the story gets very interesting, and Dr. Mraz um, alluded to this, in that when we hear tinnitus, it's not just the auditory system that is involved, but there are a number of other centers throughout the brain 
that we normally don't associate with hearing that are involved, such as areas that are involved in uh, memory, areas that are involved of how important the signal is, areas involved in general perception and also in um, sensation of body movement. Areas associated with memory are involved as well. So when we hear tinnitus and we experience it, we don't just experience it as a sound. We experience it much more broadly and we experience as an effect on us as individual. And to a certain degree, that's determined by us, the individual. And that's why, of course, tinnitus is very much an individual experience. Now, there are many different mechanisms of sound therapy or how sound therapy actually affects tinnitus. And they're overlapping. So it's difficult to separate them out, but I'm going to try and do that to a certain degree. I'm going to talk about masking, relaxation, attention diversion, and adaptation as forms of mechanism that can explain how sound can assist tinnitus. So let's start with, with masking, which has been mentioned, is the foundation of many sound therapies. Now here, we introduce a sound that covers or partially covers the tinnitus with another sound. Now often people will say, well, I don't want that. Why would I want to introduce another sound? I've got the sound going on in my head already. Well, the idea here is that we introduce a much more pleasant sound, a sound that's under your control, that you can turn on and off and adjust the level of sound, that gives you a sense of control and gives you a break, a sense of relief from the tinnitus. And Masking is created by activity, new activity, more activity within the hearing nerve that essentially suppresses or swamps the other activity related to tinnitus. That's traditionally how we've thought about masking. But there's another form of masking as well. And we call this informational masking. What do we mean by this? Well, instead of covering up the sound at the level of the ear and the hearing nerve and driving activity up through the brain. Informational basking is about interfering with the ability of the brain to process the tinnitus signal. Essentially the brain is given new sound that's interesting and complicated and that draws the attention of the brain away from the tinnitus signal to try and process the, the, the new sound that's actually involved there. And so it's the information of the signal, the details and the interesting things about the sound that begins to interfere with tinnitus. Tinnitus sound therapy can also help by providing relaxation. Most of us will know that our tinnitus was worse when we're stressed, such as giving a presentation such as this. Um, my tinnitus is a little bit worse. And relaxation sounds can assist in unwinding the brain's attention to tinnitus. And so that acts on parts of the brain that are involved in emotion, relaxation and controlling stress. Attention is a very important part of tinnitus. I think we all will realise that if we sit and listen to tinnitus it becomes very obvious and it's very difficult to draw our attention away from it. So sound therapy related to attention is trying to capture your attention and move it away from the tinnitus onto other sounds. So normally tinnitus will capture our attention and it's very difficult to let that go. But with sounds that we're trying to do with sound therapy and attention, we're shifting the focus away from the tinnitus onto the new sounds, and so it's an attention diversion strategy, and this can be very effective as well. Now all these strategies hopefully have a long-term effect of adaptation of the auditory pathways. Sometimes we call this auditory plasticity. This is where the functional relationship between neurons in the brain and regions of the brain reorganizes in a way to push tinnitus aside, and that can happen when we use sound repetitive over a long period of time that interferes with our negative thoughts 
and emotions associated with tinnitus and provides long-term stimulation as well as attention diversion away from the tinnitus itself. And with time, this can lead to lasting and long-term reduction in the tinnitus without the need for continuous sound therapy. Now, what effects can sound therapy actually have? Now, this is a slide undertake um, some research undertaken between the group here in Auckland and a group in Italy, uh, Luca Dalbo's research group, and we looked to undertake a, a study investigating the long-term effects of combination devices using hearing aids and a background sound to interfere with tinnitus. And what's interesting is we see a couple of different effects. The first effect that we see is a, re a reduction in the perceived intensity or how loud the tinnitus is. This occurs and stabilizes after approximately three months. Then we see another effect that continues to improve over time. And we believe that this is the psychological dimension of tinnitus, how we think about it. So sound therapy in this instance is probably having at least two effects to help improve tinnitus in the daily lives of the individuals. So here we have a situation where tinnitus is reducing over time and improving quality of life through the use of these sound devices. Just some new ideas I thought I'd throw out there. Now, just imagine for a moment that this little angry face here represents your tinnitus. Now, some people will hear tinnitus in one ear, some in another, some in the center of the head, uh, but sometimes the tinnitus will appear in a different position in the head. Now, typically when we undertake sound therapy, we present sounds equally over both ears, which gives an approximate perception of sound coming from the center of the head. We've been working on a sound therapy that involves moving the perceived location of the sound that we're playing from the center of the head to lie on top of the tinnitus. And this is another form of what we call that informational masking. And we believe that this can at least improve slightly the effectiveness of sound and sound therapy. So this might be something that will be coming out in the future. Another thing that Dr. Moraes also mentioned was the benefit that some people have through the use of nature sounds. This is a study that looked at a group using nature sounds in combination with hearing aids, streaming sounds to the hearing aids via uh, smartphone devices, compared to a group that uses conventional sounds, a broadband hissing shower-like sound. Now, what's interesting is both groups receive benefits because we see a situation here before and after the use of sound therapy. And this is a questionnaire and the lower scores are improvements. We see this also for the other group that used conventional broadband hissing sound. But what's interesting, which we'd like to explore further, is the continued benefit and improvement, growth of improvement with nature sounds over time as opposed to the stabilization that seems to occur uh, with current sound therapies. Uh, some of these ideas and a little bit more information on what I do and the clinic that I run is available on this website and you're welcome to go on there and uh, download some free information and see what that information is there and the therapies that we offer at our clinic. And just uh, acknowledgement, um, I'd like to thank the American Tinnitus Association for their continued um, support of some of the research and for this invitation to talk to you tonight, and from a number of groups throughout New Zealand and internationally that help fund our research. So thank you very much, and I look forward to talking to you later on when hopefully uh, Dr. Mraz and I will be able to answer some of your questions. Well, thank you, Dr. Searchfield, for that detailed explanation of how sound therapy works for tinnitus patients. As you can see, it's a lot more complex than most people realize. And one of the reasons that we do the webinars is so your family and friends can come on and see and understand what you're dealing with. So some of the sound management strategies you have um, directly involved uh, and, and 
that you can use and take away from this particular presentation of the sound ma management strategies that Dr. Searchfield presented and has actually been involved in developing. For those of you in the audience tonight who have, you know, perhaps tried a sound therapy maybe a long time ago and it didn't have optimal results, I hope you are encouraged by what Dr. Surgefield and Dr. Mraz have presented here tonight and you will consider looking at sound therapy once again. With all the new information and the new devices that are available and the clinicians that understand it so much better than back in that day and we have so much more information. Plus, we want you to stay tuned for the upcoming ATA webinars where we will be keeping you informed of new studies and treatment options. Later in the program, we'll give you a preview of all the topics for this next year and how you can find out what they are and when they are. Now I'd like to introduce you to an ATA member, someone who has been through the trials of tinnitus and who has come through on the other side. For some people with tinnitus, they still haven't found a treatment or therapy that works for them. And that's why ATA continues to fund research towards new treatments and cures. But there are some who have found those answers. And in this case, it was through a sound therapy program with Dr. Mraz. I'd like to introduce you to Connie Decker. She's an ATA member, a grandmother of seven and soon to be eight, and a patient of Dr. Mraz, who is here to share her journey with tinnitus with all of you. Connie? Although it's hard to say for sure, my tinnitus journey most likely began with a horseback riding accident October 2009. For months afterwards, I noticed unusual no noises in my ears, and then one morning, I suddenly awoke to very loud ringing sounds. I jumped out of bed and poured peroxide in my ears, hoping it would stop, but it didn't. Pharmacists and the internet gave me no hope. Pete took me to various doctors. One asked why I was making a big deal out of tinnitus because it wasn't going to kill me. I never went back to that doctor. The ENT who had tinnitus himself said there was no cure or treatment. I would just have to live with it. Very quickly, tinnitus began to negatively impact every part of my life. I couldn't sleep or eat. I was a wreck. My entire family saw that I was deteriorating physically and emotionally. I was thin, pale, and frail by most accounts. Pete, my husband, was afraid I was going to starve myself to death. My daughter kept saying, I want my mama back. When my tinnitus Again, I had two grandchildren and another on the way. I certainly didn't want my legacy to my children and grandchildren to be their mother and grandmother starved herself to death because she couldn't handle tinnitus. At a dental appointment in 2010, my very concerned dentist found out I had tinnitus. He immediately contacted a friend and colleague who also had tinnitus and had been a patient of Dr. Astroboff at Emory University Hospital. When I called Emory, I was referred to Dr. Norma Morass. October 2020, excuse me, 2010, I walked into Dr. Morass's office accompanied by my sister Laura Ann, and I immediately began um, to be filled with hope. Dr. Morass spent a long time with us uh, finding out what was going on in my life, explaining tinnitus, the tinnitus retraining therapy and hearing aids with sound generators. Finally, someone had answers for me and sympathy. I knew I was not leaving her office without purchasing the hearing aids and signing up for TRT. Dr. Moraz had my hearing aids in two days. When my sister and I do anything fun or adventuresome, we call ourselves Thelma and Louise. Therefore, I named my tinnitus hearing aids. Thelma and Louise. Well, Thelma and Louise have allowed me to live with tinnitus. I never thought in those first few months of having tinnitus that I would ever enjoy life again. As my sister said, I am a Dr. Moraz success story. After a few months of therapy, Pete was able to attend my last TRT session. Dr. Moraz spent a lot of time educating him about the therapy and hearing aids. 
I asked him many times if he had any questions, but he was unusually quiet. Finally, he looked at Dr. Morez and said, thank you for giving my wife back to me. Well, Connie's participation in this webinar is dedicated to the memory of her husband, Pete, who passed away unexpectedly just one year after she started the TRT. We want to thank Dr. Moraz and Connie for being persistent and having that good year. He was her rock and savior in the whole ordeal, and Connie wanted to convey to us that she would likely not be here today if it hadn't been for his concern and love as well. Thank you, Connie. That was obviously a very moving account of your tinnitus experience. And I know that tonight there's many of you out there that have had similar experiences yourself. As we've learned tonight, sound therapy is currently the best way for people with tinnitus to find some relief. Your story also highlights the importance of making sure you talk to others about your tinnitus, as well as find a qualified medical professional when seeking tinnitus care. And now, it's time for the question and answer portion of the evening. We're going to ask each one of our presenters tonight to come back on and in put their webcams on, and you're going to have the opportunity to have the questions you've given us answered. And so we're going to start right away. Um, if you did not have your, if you submitted your question on your control panel, we're going to take a look at it. But be sure to keep sending those in because even if yours doesn't get answered tonight, we will be using them for tinnitus today as well as future presentations. So I'm going to ask the first question here. How many hours a day do I need to wear the device, and how long do I need to wear them until I can see some results? Um, Dr. Moraz, I'm going to throw that one your way if I could. Sure. Um, as far as wearing the devices, uh, the main thing is to wear it as much as you comfortably and reasonably can in your day. Um, Days get hectic, schedules change. So if, if things are limited, at least if you can wear devices for two to four hours as a, just a bare minimum, that would be great. Um, but as much as you comfortably can in your day is, should suffice. Okay, and I'm going to follow up another one. This kind of follows right along, so I'm going to stay with you, Dr. Mraz. These devices are pretty expensive. Can I return them if they don't work? Devices can be returned um, across the U.S. They traditionally have a 30-day uh, um, adjustment time. Although we're not expecting to see results considering this is a whole retraining process within 30 days, most patients can quickly identify if this is a very convenient way for them to have sound. So, but. Um, if, if it wasn't meeting their needs or it's just uncomfortable for them, uh, they can certainly return them within that adjustment period. All right, and here's another question, Dr. Searchfield. I'm going to ask this one of you. Um, since you've done research, this person's wanting to know, um, how do I know up front that I'm a good candidate for sound therapy? Do I have to wear, do I have to have hearing loss to wear combination hearing aids or sound generators? Well, that's a very good question. Uh, normally, if the individual has a hearing loss, and it's often difficult without a proper hearing test to know whether some hearing loss actually exists. Um, if there is a hearing loss there, a hearing aid in combination with a sound generator is obvious um, a great road to go down. When there isn't the hearing loss there, the sound can still be used, and that can be the sound portion of the same sort of device. Um, these can be manufactured without the hearing aid part, or our sound through another portable means, or even a desktop device. Uh, as Dr. Mraz has talked about, it's very much about understanding um, you as an individual and what is going to suit your lifestyle to try and make sure that as much sound and as appropriate levels of sound, types of sound can be used, but it really does need to suit your lifestyle and also the hearing test results. So very much down to the individual. 
Well, and I'm going to follow this one because it kind of follows along the same line. So Dr. Serge Field, I'm going to ask you on, on this one as well. What is the difference from just you know downloading white noise off the computer? So they're asking, um, will it work the same as the sound therapy from devices? Well, sometimes the sound may be very, very similar, um, but what I is more so is the the interaction with the clinician, the understanding about the tinnitus, the counselling that goes along with it. We often say that sound therapy is really an aid to the counselling. It's a mechanism to change the way that the auditory system is working. But if the auditory system isn't responsive to the sound or isn't willing to um, accept the therapy ideas, then it can just be another intrusive sound. So it's really important that appropriate framework be used, combination of sound and all the counselling and other information that experienced clinicians can offer you as a tinnitus patient. All right, and I've just got time for one or two more questions. Um, here's a question, Dr. Mraz, I'm going to ask you. Um, in fact, it was directed to you. Um, Dr. Mraz, I have both tinnitus and hyperacusis. I am worried that the sound generating part will be too loud for my hyperacusis. Are there devices that can treat both tinnitus and hyperacusis? Yes. Um, the great thing about the devices is, or any sound that's being used, is that we, when that measurement that we do, that I mentioned in the slides with doing the audiological evaluation, we also assess um, people's sensitivity to sound, so their loudness, discomfort levels, then we can set devices so that it stays within the comfort of where they are so that over time we can build their tolerance to sound and then um, adjust it accordingly as, as things improve. So they can certainly wear combination units or use a number of devices that can address both of those issues comfortably. Okay, two last questions. This one is for Dr. Searchfield. It says, I have had tinnitus for 30 years. Does sound therapy work better for people who have recent tinnitus onset, or can it work just as well for me if I've had it for a long time? Well, that's a really great question, and uh, it's, again, a difficult one. You're sending all the difficult ones to me. Um, <laughs> in that um, the auditory system in the brain is what we call plastic, and it can change. Normally, if there's been an injury, the, the brain can change uh, more or to a greater extent the more recent the injury. So while we might say it would be easier if the individual hasn't had tinnitus for a long period of time, it doesn't mean that sound therapy won't work for a person that has had it for many years. And I certainly I've seen patients, and I'm sure Dr. Mraz has as well, where we're surprised that the person has had tinnitus for such a long period of time, but often they're very responsive uh, to tinnitus sound therapy. So again, it's a, a, an answer that perhaps is sitting on the fence, but it's really that um, as individuals we all respond in different ways and while it would be good to see individuals with tinnitus as soon as we can because that's when we might get the most effect, uh, even people that had tinnitus for a very long time are still likely to benefit from sound therapy. Great. Well, thank you so much for the answers and, you know, for taking your time. Every one of these pre presenters volunteer their time to help us. Now, quickly, I'm going to ask Jennifer one last question. What is the tinnitus, the American Tinnitus Association position on sound therapy as an effective treatment for tinnitus? Good question. Uh, we get that one a lot. And uh, the answer is just to, to reinforce what you said at the very beginning of the program, Melanie. Um, APA does not endorse or recommend any particular product or treatment. Um, what, we, what we do provide is information about available treatments. And we do suggest uh, the most important thing uh, that you can do for yourself is find a qualified tinnitus health professional uh, to help you figure out what mode of treatment is going to best suit your tinnitus situation. Um, and you can do that online at ata.org. If you go to our homepage, you click on the button at the top that says find a provider, and you should hopefully be able to find somebody um, near you who can help you get on the path to, to treatment success. 
Well, I want to thank each of our presenters again. I want to thank you for attending our webinar tonight on sound therapy. I hope you learned as much as we all have and that you have taken away from this webinar the importance of using sound to help manage your tinnitus. Our next webinar will be on March 15, 2016, and that webinar will feature Dr. Michael Hoffer, an MD from the University of Miami, and Dr. Jim Kaltenbach, PhD from the Cleveland Clinic, who will discuss pharmacology and what drugs have been tested and are being tested for tinnitus. This is an area of research that is progressing and a webinar you surely won't want to miss. So registration will be available for that webinar soon on ata.org. But attendance is limited, so do register early. In the meantime, go to ata.org and check out the list of speakers for 2016, or you can refer to the back page of Tinnitus Today. We've printed them right there for you to easily see. If you're not a member, please consider joining and enjoy these valuable benefits. We have six webinars for you for the 2016 included in your membership. Also, I want to thank our pre presenters tonight, Dr. Norma Mraz and Dr. Grant Searchfield. And Connie, thank you so much, Connie Decker, for sharing your story. Um, it really takes a lot to do that, and we really appreciate it. We are truly fortunate to have had them with us here tonight. Our ATA staff, uh, Jody Asmus and Jennifer Bourne, thank you again for joining us, and we hope we will see you in March at our next webinar. Good night now.